Do you love horror, science fiction, B-movies, horror hosts, old-time radio, just plain spooky stuff? Then you should sign up at patreon.com slash lordbloodraw. You'll be supporting the production of Lord Blood Draw's Nerve Rackin' Theater, presenting the best, worst, and wildest horror films ever made. Lord Blood Draw's Nerve Rackin' Auditorium, featuring the best of old-time radio horror. Captain Paxar's Star Cadet Hour, showing classic 1950s sci-fi shows for Star Cadets of all ages. Plus, you'll get exclusive access to bonus content, like Behind the Curtains of the Nerve Rackin' Auditorium, a deep dive into radio horror. Lord Blood Draw's B-Movie Reviews, a look at a classic low-budget drive-in feature, and much more. Sign up today at patreon.com slash lordbloodraw for the love of horror. Attention, Star Cadets! Stand by for action! Captain Paxar says prepare to travel time and soar through space while facing the worst villains of the past and the future. Stand by for Captain Paxar's Star Cadet Hour. Star Cadets, I, Captain Paxar, am speaking to you from the secret headquarters of the Interdimensional Peace Force. Today's mission is as follows. Flash Gordon risks traveling back in time to the year 1953 to find a device that could destroy Earth's future. Stand by for action as Flash Gordon faces a deadline at noon. Planets and suns race toward infinity. Dead worlds and live worlds alike, separated by millions of light years. And yet, these members of the galaxy in this age of space travel have become interdependent, not only economically, but politically. This is the far-off galaxy of Magna Mater, the galaxy of dead planets, icy graveyard rolling through space, and each with a communication station. And now the Sky Flash carrying Flash Gordon, Dale and Dr. Zarkov, enters the outer rim of Magna Mata on a routine outer space patrol. Suddenly, all around them, the tranquil peace of these dead worlds is shattered. First, the dead planet Isis. Next, it was Osiris. Next came Mithra. And finally, Bacchus. And in the sky flash. I don't understand it. First Isis, then Osiris, Mithra and Bacchus shattering in space. It's weird, Doctor. Crazy. Four planets blowing up in rapid succession. Why? Why should that happen? It seems to be some mysterious atomic force, Flash. Possibly a chain reaction operating from some central source. Well, it's about the last of the chain, Doctor. There's only one dead planet left, and that's Minerva. And there it is. Dead ahead. Dale, will you check the Geiger counter? We're coming into a very heavy radioactive dust ball, Doctor. Check its type. Yes, sir. Horizontal, 105. Vertical, 10. Why, it's radioactive dust from duranium. Durinium? Impossible. 
Why, Doctor? Is it indigenous to a particular area or planet of the galaxy out of this range? Yes, it's found only on Colossia. But it's not only that. Duranium was only discovered a few years ago, Flash. Dr. Zarkov made an extensive study of its properties for GBI research and analysis. I found it to be probably the most powerful fissionable material in the universe. And the slowest. What do you mean, the slowest? Well, unlike other nuclear materials, its fission is a slow, creeping process. We estimated that a bomb made of duranium would take over 1,200 years to explode. Then it couldn't be duranium, Dale. If it was a bomb that exploded those planets, it had to be put there in, let's see, 1953. I'll check again. No, it still comes out duranium. Something wrong on Minerva, too. I'd better contact the communication station. Skyflash Earth Patrol calling Minerva. Skyflash calling Minerva. Come in, Minerva. Come in. Minerva, come in. I can't get through. The communication station's out. What now? Let's move in, see if we can get a better look. Why should the communication station be out on Minerva? Flash, we can't move through this atomic fog much longer without getting contaminated. I know, but we need information. For all we know, that chain reaction explosion may move from this galaxy into others. Maybe we can find the clue on Minerva. Minerva just exploded. That's the last of the galaxy. Let's get out of here. Report back to Earth. Now the sky flash pointed its nose toward home. But on Earth itself, strange things were happening. Foreboding events foretelling a monstrous end. First, a series of freakish weather disturbances. And after that, Panic and fear spread through every corner of the earth like wildfire. And at the Galaxy Bureau of Investigation, Commissioner Herrick interrogates a strange captive picked up by Earth agents. A Callison whose planet had sworn eternal war against the earth. Are you frightened, Commissioner Herrick? There were small explosions today that have destroyed cities, flattened mountains, inundated half a continent of your earth. These are just teasers. These were just natural phenomena, not man-made. Fool. What do I argue with you? In one hour, your precious Earth explodes. At 12 o'clock noon, there will no longer be an Earth to poison the galaxy. You're lying. You're trying to frighten us. Am I? Then look at the fate of Isis, Osiris, Mithra, Bacchus. They all gone, blown into eternity. All right, I believe you. What do you want to stop it? Name your price. Price? What can you offer when in one hour there will be nothing? A void. <laughs> Does that make you feel better, Commissioner? Come ahead, do it again. But hitting me will not find the duranium bomb smoldering into its final stage of fission. Who planted this duranium bomb? I did. You? When? Exactly. Exactly 1,208 years. Five months. Three weeks. One day, 23 hours and two minutes ago. If you speak the truth, you've stolen Dr. Zarkov's time machine. Just the principal, Commissioner. Our Galassian scientists developed it in their own way. As one who has traveled back in time, Commissioner. Let me tell you, it was an interesting experience. Where did you plant that duranium bomb, eh? Where did you bury it? You will find out for yourself, Commissioner. 
Very soon. Alan, you're sure that Geigers indicate nothing? Nothing. No, Commissioner. And they won't until fission. It's useless for you to try and locate it. At this late point in its reaction, it gives no telltale signal. You have less than one hour to live, Commander. You and every other Earthman. If we die, you die with us. I am a Kalasan Patwit. To die in this cause is an honor. Alan. Yes, sir. Establish contact with the Sky Flash at once. It's cruising in the Magnamata galaxy. If Flash Gordon or Dr. Zarkov don't come up with an answer. Calling Sky Flash. GBI headquarters. Calling Flash Gordon to the Sky Flash. Come in, Flash Gordon. That's the story. The whole story. Flash, Dr. Zarkov. We've got to figure out some way to find and deactivate the bomb. Otherwise, the Earth is doomed. There's less than one hour. A second after 12 and it'll be too late. There won't be an Earth to come back to. We're helpless up here. Completely helpless. Oh, Dr. Zarkov, there must be a way out. There must be. There's only one thing that I can think of. What is it? Lock the controls. Decelerate the ship below stomach speed. Come in here. The time machine. It's our only chance. We've got to project ourselves back into the past just as the Colossum did. We must go back through time to the middle of the 20th century. The year 1953. If we can find out where the Colossum planted that Derinium bomb, then we have a chance. How much of a chance, Doctor? A thousand to one. A million to one. Then let's take it. What's our speed now, Flash? We're at landing speed, Doctor. Three five oh an hour. Good. Now I'm going to ask you both to hold on. For the next few moments, you will be traveling back through time. The effect will be strange, possibly stupefying. You will hear nothing, see nothing, know nothing, until you are back in the sixth decade of the 20th century. Are you both ready? Ready, Doctor. now in the sixth decade of the 20th century. At ease, Star Cadets! Captain Paxar's Star Cadet Hour will be back in a moment! There it is, Dale. The Earth as it looked 1,250 years before we were born. How strange it looks. It's some kind of city, Doctor. I'm trying to check it in this book of ancient maps. Hmm. From this description, that must be a place called Washington, the capital of an ancient nation called the United States. What's our direction? East by north. Another city coming up. 
That must be New York. New York? What a strange name. Dale, set the Geiger counter for Derinium and see if you can get me a reading. Yes, Dr. Zarko. I am getting a reading, Doctor. The Derinium bomb is here, somewhere on Earth. Where, Dale? Can you locate it? Not quite. The signal is very weak, but it's a long distance from here, almost due east. No, Dale. East by north. And from the signal strength, I'd say over 3,000 miles away. East by north it is. Doctor, do you think we'll be able to exactly locate the Duranium bomb? I can only hope so, Dale. The Earth as we know it has only a half hour to live before it explodes. Well, there's nothing we can do until we cross the ocean. What kind of a world is it that we're going back to? Well, from what I remember of ancient history, it was very primitive. Just think. Nobody ever reached a height of more than 15 miles. Well, it was primitive to our way of thinking, Dale. And they just scratched the surface of atomic research. And they had to build tremendous motors housed in gigantic buildings to run the machines they used in manufacturing. It does seem ridiculous when you consider that in our century, a motor the size of my fist has more power than the gigantic steam-driven turbines they used. What about the people? What were, I mean, what are they like? They considered our Earth just as precious as we do. And most of them believed in freedom, peace, equality of opportunity. But I guess just like in our time, there are those who, for power, would make slaves of everybody else. Yes, I'm afraid so. But they didn't have our tools to fight them with. And the women, Dr. Zarkov, what were they like? Well... Instead of filling their heads full of knowledge about astrophysics, atomic research, electronic phenomena, like a certain young lady we know... Yes, well, what did they do? Sit home and knit? Well, I wouldn't say that was all they did. But they certainly knew their way around a kitchen better than they did around a laboratory. Strange craft at two o'clock. Oh. In a moment, we'll be able to see it out the light window. Let's see. What is that clumsy craft, Doctor? That's an aeroplane. Did you see the way it was pulled through the air by those gigantic egg beaters? I'll bet it couldn't do more than 300 miles per hour. No wonder they didn't cruise around in outer space. A clumsy craft like that would have trouble getting off the ground. Well, that thing on the water is even funnier than the airplane. Yeah, that was a ship. You see... Air travel was only about 50 years old at this time. And a great deal of travel over land and water was still popular. What a world to live in. Yes. As Dale said, primitive. But a world. Something we won't have to go back to unless we find that Derinium bomb. And quickly. Where are they? Why don't we hear from them? There's nothing we can do about it now, Alan, except wait. Wait and pray. Land coming up, Doctor. 11.35. It took us exactly five minutes to cross the ocean. City coming up at two o'clock, Doctor. That must be a place called Paris. Flash, slow down. The Geiger's up to maximum. We're almost in the immediate vicinity of the bomb. Flash, look. The Geiger's hit maximum. That means the bomb is directly below us. It must be someplace in that city. What's the name? Berlin. Finding the bomb there is going to be like searching for a neutron and a molecule. We can find it with this. The question is, can we find it in time? Flash, is there some place we can land? There's a clearing below. We can hide the ship there for a while. Good. The inhabitants may be hostile. And that's true. If we don't find that bomb in 20 minutes, it will be all over. We'll find it. We've got to find it. Hang on, 20th century. Here we come. Landing positions, everybody. The sky flash has landed in the forest outside of Berlin. Having with its occupants, Flash Gordon, Dale Arden, and Dr. Zarkoff, been projected by the time machine 1,250 years back through time to Berlin with only 20 minutes remaining for the Earth to exist. 
Commissioner Herrick, pinning all of his hopes on Flash Gordon, waits tensely, while the Callison, who planted the Earth-destroying bomb, sits calmly by. All over Berlin, people have seen a strange object spinning and glittering in the sky. It is thought that this weird visitation from some other planet has landed somewhere in the outskirts of Berlin. Reports from Paris and New York also indicate that this flying pencil, or whatever it is, was sighted in those areas. Meanwhile, the people of Berlin wait in dread and terror for what will come next.
fancy. Eight seconds now. Count that. Fifty-seven. Fifty-six. Fifty-five. Fifty-four. Fifty-three. Fifty-two. Fifty-one. Flash. Only 30 seconds left. Plenty, Dale. We had two seconds to spare. <laughs> it looks as though this tired old world will still be around for a while. Yes. Whatever Flash did, it worked. I watched the route coming out. I think I can get us back there. Flash, let's stay here in our ancestors' time for a few days. It should be fun telling them everything that's going to happen to them for the next 1,200 years. Fun? Well, maybe for us, Dale, but not for them. It is the mystery of the future that provides the challenge for men to make history. You take that away and there's no reason for dreams, ambition, discovery. Well, I hadn't thought of it that way. You're right, of course, but... Well, it would have been fun to meet my great multiplied by 100 grandfather. <laughs> and a few hours later, as night falls on Berlin, into the starlit sky flashes a silvery streak. Suddenly, it stops. It seems to hang for a moment, suspended in air. Then, before the eyes of a few stargazers and lovers who observed it, the sky flash disappeared into the future from whence it came. science fiction, B-movies, horror hosts, old-time radio, just plain spooky stuff, then you should sign up at patreon.com slash lordbloodraw. You'll be supporting the production of Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rack and Theater, presenting the best, worst, and wildest horror films ever made. Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rack and Auditorium, featuring the best of old-time radio horror. Captain Paxar's Star Cadet Hour, showing classic 1950s sci-fi shows for star cadets of all ages. Plus, you'll get exclusive access to bonus content, like behind the curtains of the Nerve Rack and Auditorium, a deep dive into radio horror. Lord Blood Draws B-Movie Reviews, a look at a classic low-budget drive-in feature, and much more. Sign up today at patreon.com slash lordbloodraw for the love of horror. Welcome back, Star Cadets. 
I, Captain Axar, will now brief you on the second phase of our mission. Scott McLeod, aka Space Angel, assists a young boy who searches deep space for his missing father. Stand by for action as Space Angel encounters the incident of the loud planet. for another exciting adventure in outer space with Scott McCloud, Space Angel, in the story of Incident of the Loud Planet. Our story opens at Earth Control on a routine day. The dispatchers are about to okay a Venus Junction space freighter launch. Venus Junction, Venus Junction, this is Earth Control, over. Earth Control, this is Venus Junction. Go ahead. Here's your party, Chief. Space Freighter 005, this is Earth Control. Request granted. Launch your cargo capsule on orbit 2.76. Earth Control, this is Space Freighter 005. Roger. Releasing cargo on orbit 2.76. Over. Hey, what's this? Oh, no, it couldn't be. Master Control. Master Control, this is Station 7. Alert. This is Master Control. What's wrong, Bill? I'm recording red alert in Sector 045. Over. Station 7, red alert. Sector 045. Roger. Hang on, Bill. This is Master Control. Put me through to the Chief. This is an emergency. Come in, Earth Control. What's up? Disturbance in Sector 045, Chief. Source unidentified. It's jamming communications. Check all stations and verify. And move, man. Check. All stations, stand by for fix on unidentified signal and report. Roger, Master Control. a bite of your lunch yet. How long do you think you could keep this up without making yourself sick? You've got to eat. I'll eat, Mom. I, I'm just not hungry yet. Oh, dear. I'm okay, Mom. Just leave me alone, please. No, Johnny, I won't. It's high time we put a stop to this. I've put up with this beep, beep, beep of your equipment every day for three years now while you've searched the skies for your father. Johnny, it's no use. He's gone. He's not coming back. He is, too. I'm going to find him if it takes all my life. Don't stop me, Mom. Someday I'm going to find that wild planet. It has to come back. It has to. Oh, Johnny, dear, it's just no use. Oh, how I've prayed that... Mom! Mom, that's it! I found it! Look! It's the wild planet! We found Dad! Oh, Johnny! Johnny, do something! Yahoo! You know it! I'll peek the game! Hit the bearing computer and recorder! Uh, and now what? That's it! In a minute, we'll know the position and speed of the planet Sonics, and Earth Space Control can send searchers after it. I did it, Mom! I did it! I produced an element that can't be found any place on Earth! But, Chief, we put the data through the analyzer, and it's unable to locate the source. Hmm. Put me through to the Starduster. It's operating in that area. Maybe we can get some missing data from the Space Angel. Okay, Chief. Stand by. Urgent signal from Master Control, Scott. It must be the Chief. Right, Crystal. Master Control, this is the Starduster. Go ahead, Chief. Scott. There's a strange signal coming from the direction of your patrol area. Have you seen anything? Sure have, Chief. 
and our wave detector registers sonite. And it's getting stronger. Sonite? Are you sure? I'm afraid so, Chief. We haven't had a blast yet. Here it comes! So far, Chief, but... Hey, Skipper, our automatic guidance system is knocked out. We're coming apart at the sea. She, she's out of control. Where can the mysterious sonite signal be coming from? Will the space dart be able to escape its force? Be sure and see the next exciting episode of Space Angel. Last off for another exciting adventure in outer space with Scott McCloud, Space Angel, in the story of Incident of the Loud Planet. Remember last time, Johnny transmitted a signal into space and was receiving an answer when Scott and his crew were suddenly thrown out of control by a mysterious sonite signal. Scott, we're spinning! What's happening, Scott? When we blasted into that sonite belt, it threw us out of control. And when I chopped off the power, the sonite waves took over and are pulling us along in their wake. Hmm. Now we're churning along with it like a chip of wood on a gigantic wave. Eh, Skipper? But how do we get out of this? Just hang on to your hats. It's going to be quite a jolt. Try to strap yourselves in now. This is it. Right, Skipper. All okay here, my lad. Let her rip. I'm going to pour on all the coal she could take and blast free. We haul. on my middle. That's enough of that for one day. Taurus, you're just getting old. Earth Control. Earth Control, this is Starduster. Over. Starduster, this is Earth Control. Go ahead. Earth Control, this is Starduster. Clear pad for landing. Priority one. Roger, Starduster. I'll notify the chief. Take pad three. Chief, this is Master Control. Space Angel just landed in the Starduster. Splendid, Master Control. Send the Space Angel right in. Yes, sir. And call Dr. Mace for an immediate conference. Dr. Mace. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. My viewer was knocked out and I never did get a glimpse of the asteroid. So night wave at that point was two space units across, Professor Mace. Hmm. From that angle, I would say the sonite waves must have been transmitted from Earth. The sonite asteroid only magnified them and bounced them back. Then sonite transmission could knock out any spacecraft that got into the path of its transmission? Not the path of transmission, Scott. It's the bounce back wave from the greater source of sonite that is dangerous. That's why we've got to find out who, when, where, what is broadcasting this thing. We're running the recorded data through now. We'll know exactly where it's coming from in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> come in. Pardon me, Chief. There's a young boy out here who says he's been broadcasting Sonite. I thought you'd like to talk to him. Would I? I'll say I would. Send him in here. Your computer pinpoints the Sonite transmission in the 1200 block on Pine Street, right here in the city. <coughs> and where do you live, young man? Uh, 1240 Pine Street, sir. 
Young man, don't you know that transmitting sonite is against the law? Yes, sir, but... Do you know you almost killed the space angel? <laughs> no, Chief, don't be so tough on him. It was the only way to locate the wild planet Sonex through harmonic response. And, and my dad was lost on it over three years ago, and, and I found it. I have the computer tape, and... and Wait a minute. Slow down. The boy makes sense. The planet Sonex was in this area three years ago. And Professor Kendall, who went out to survey it, has never returned. Scott, this looks like a job for the Space Angel. Oh, boy, the Space Angel. Roger, Chief. I'll, uh, I'll notify the Space Angel to have the Starduster ready for blastoff first thing in the morning. Will Scott find the planet Sonex? Can Professor Kendall still be alive? Don't miss the next exciting episode of Space Angel. for another exciting adventure in outer space with Scott McCloud, Space Angel, in the story of Incident of the Loud Planet. Remember last time, Johnny was picked up by the space control for transmitting sonite, which was interfering with space travel lanes. Johnny pointed out that he believes through harmonic response, he's discovered the missing planet Sonex. The chief then ordered Scott to blast off and go in search of the wild planet Sonex on which Johnny's dad has been lost. Scott, is the Starduster all ready to blast off on schedule? Ready, willing, and able, sir. Crystal's helping Professor Mace check out our new tracking gear, and Taurus is directing the loading of supplies. Where's the Space Angel? Can I meet the Space Angel? <coughs> uh, no, Johnny, he, he's uh, already on board. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can't get you two together when we get back. You're going along too, huh, Mr. Scott? <laughs> You bet, Johnny. Uh, I'll be taking along. Then will you tell him I know he can find my dad? I'm counting on the Space Angel. I'm sure the Space Angel will do his very best, Johnny. Thank you, Mr. Scott, sir. Okay if I go down and look over the Starduster? Sure, Johnny. Go ahead. Launching crew, report to Platform 3. Launching crew. That kid's sharp, Scott. Could be he'll catch on that you're the Space Angel. I know, Chief. I'd better get aboard before he returns and fires more questions at me. Okay, Scott. Good luck, and stay in close contact, my friend. Right, Chief. All set, kids? Ready when you are. Okay here, Skipper. A-okay, Scott. Space Control. Space Control. This is Starduster. Ready for countdown. Over. Roger, Starduster. Ready for countdown. Clear launching station three of all equipment and personnel. Emergency vehicles. Stand by. Eight, seven. Atomic engine activator. Atomic engine activator, go. Six, five. Trajectory angle. Four, three. Three point zero five, go. Two, one, zero. Lift off. Gravity, I'll switch over to our own gyro gravity equalizer. Roger, Taurus. Trajectory looks very good, Scott. Roger, Crystal. We're in free flight. How's the new Sonite tracking equipment working, Chris? All okay. I'm just checking the present position of the Sonite asteroid. Hey, Taurus. Yes, Skipper? My radiation indicator isn't working. Better go aft and check the shielding. I skip her right away. Probably a resistor out. What? What? What the? But I'll be. 
What? Here. Hey, Skipper, I found a mouse in the machinery. Johnny Kendall, what are you doing here? I sneaked aboard while they were loading the Sonite tracking equipment. How on earth did you survive the blast off? I strapped myself to the computer rack. That's why your indicator wasn't working, Skipper. Hey, where's the space angel? Well, uh, um... Uh... You see, lad, he's, uh, uh... Johnny, I suppose we'll have to take you into our confidence. And trust you'll never tell anyone. I'm the space angel. Now, as long as you're here, we have no choice but to take you along. Taurus, see if you can rig up a spacesuit for our new crew member, Johnny Kendall. We're entering Sector 5. Won't be long now. There it is. The Sonite Planet. The Sonite Planet. Will they find Professor Kendall? Be sure to see the next exciting episode of Space Angel. for another exciting adventure in outer space with Scott McCloud, Space Angel, in the story of Incident of the Loud Planet. You remember last time, Johnny had stowed away on the space dart. Scott had gone too far to turn back. So agreed to take Johnny along on their search for the Sonite Planet and Johnny's dad, Professor Kendall. It certainly looks evil enough, Skipper. It looks completely dead. How could anyone survive on such a place? If anybody could, it would be your father, Johnny. He's a very capable man. Aye, laddie. I read one of his books on how to survive in hostile environments. Gravity reading 0 0.015. Moving up fast, Scott. Right, Chris. We'll drop into orbit now and survey this planetoid. Taurus, get on the analyzer and check for atmosphere content. Aye, Skipper. Crystal, check the radiation and ground conditions, please. Right, Scott. Aren't we going to land, sir? Not until we take a look around, Johnny. We have to know what we're getting into. Unidentified spacecraft approaching. Your Highness, we have an alert. Unidentified spacecraft coming in on low approach. Well, General, shall we go see who our unexpected visitor is? Of course, Your Highness. Who knows, but we may fall heir to another useful prize. <laughs> Safe enough, let's drop down and drag the area. Atmosphere readings, Taurus? Atmosphere negligible, Skipper. Geiger reading in the green. Safe gravity, 0 0.094 Gs. Very good. They're coming closer now, Your Highness. Hmm. Does the stranger have any markings, General? It, it, Your Highness, it looks like the Space Angel ship. <gasps> the Space Angel. I might have known. Your Highness, the tower. They'll spot the sonar transmission tower. Of course they will, you fool. We'll just prepare a little surprise reception for the space angel. <laughs> Why, of course, your highness.
Sure hope my dad's down there. Hi, lad. Hey, look. Was that a tower? Out here in the middle of nowhere? Hey, Taurus. Check a stern. Hi, Skipper. Choke and Jupiter, it's a tower, all right. And there's smoke coming up near it. Then it must be coming from an underground installation. Oh, boy. Dad must be there. He's alive. He must be alive. Chances are pretty good, Johnny. Stand by, crew. We're coming about for a landing. Legs extended. Steady power. Steady. Power steady. Ready for touchdown. That space angel is such a fool. Is everything in readiness for his surprise, General? Everything, Your Highness. <laughs> The space angel will get the surprise reception he deserves. What kind of a surprise has the queen for the space angel? Will Scott fall into their trap? Don't miss the next exciting episode of Space Angel. for another exciting adventure in outer space with Scott McCloud, Space Angel, in the story of Incident of the Loud Planet. Remember last time, Scott, Crystal, Taurus, and Johnny saw a sonite tower on the mysterious planet. Unbeknown to Scott, Queen Zora and her henchman, the General, have spotted the Space Angel. Open outer panel. Outer panel opening. How's the suit fit, Johnny? Very comfortable, sir. Mr. Taurus is a genius. A-OK -okay here then, Crystal. The brave fool is opening the hatchway already. It is the Space Angel, all right. And a small figure. They're headed straight for our Sonite Tower. Checking communications, Crystal. Loud and clear, Scott. Look, Johnny. There's a door in the main building just to the right of the tower. I can see it, sir. Let us accommodate our friends, General. Open the Sonite Tower door. Yes, Your Highness. Look, sir, the door. Scott, be careful. Looks like somebody is inviting us in. Scott. Ah, oh, our friends are trying to decide whether or not they should enter our trap. Are you ready, General? Most certainly, Your Highness. Okay, Johnny, this is it. Stick close to me. A strange generator room, sir. Yeah, Johnny. You can bet somebody's around opening and closing doors for us. It's the evil Queen Zora. I thought she was dead. I am so sorry to disappoint you, Space Angel. But now you see it is you who will be destroyed. Is my father, Professor Kendall, here? Professor Kendall is helping us process sonite so that we can control the universe. That's not true! That's not true! My father would never help you! Not willingly, I will admit. <laughs> but we have had ways of persuading the good professor since he fell into our trap three years ago. You see, Space Angel, we have prepared sonite capsules so we can put them in orbit around all inhabited planets. And you, Space Angel, and your little friend have brought us the means to deliver them. Your spaceship, the Starduster. The Starduster? I see. If the people of the universe refuse to pay you tribute, you'll activate the Sonite. Of course. I will rule the universe. I want to see my father. Of course, little man. General, send the professor to join his son. We have no further use for him. 
In what fashion do you intend to eliminate us, your royal highness? You are standing directly over a sonite deposit. I need only throw this switch. And you will be shattered as the waves pass through you to the tower above. Professor Kendall. Johnny, my son. Dad! You, you found me. A touching reunion indeed. Too bad it must end so soon. You get that, Taurus? Aim for the ball at the top of the tower. But don't fire until I give the word. Aye, Skipper. You have been most helpful, Professor, but your usefulness has ended. No, Taurus. The tower has been hit. Don't throw that switch. You have activated the Sonite. When the load control is destroyed, the activator is still going. Quick, we must get out. The whole planet will explode. That's right. We only have seconds. Grab a space suit, Professor. Horace, Crystal, stand by to blast off. Aye, Skipper. Quick, look through the viewer. Oh, by Jiminy Gully. I wonder if Queen Zora escaped. I don't know, Chris. But our mission is accomplished. If I knew who you were, Space Angel, I could thank you properly. That's right, Dad. But no one knows who the Space Angel is. All well that ends well. Be sure and see the next exciting story with Scott McCloud, Space Angel. Great job, Star Cadets! The Captain will debrief you in a moment when Captain Paxaw's Star Cadet Hour returns! Star Cadets, you've all served with valor and honor. Flash Gordon, Space Angel, and I, Captain Paxar of the Interdimensional Peace Force, salute you. You may now stand down until we meet again at the appointed time coordinates when we will again undertake a daring mission through time, space, and alternate dimensions. Until then, Star Cadets, always remember, he, the peace.